The time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Greetings all, you are watching or listening to, or and listening to, another episode of the Pantsilla Podcast. I am Jamila and I'm here with Comrade Evan. And my goodness, we are representing the All African People's Revolutionary Party, in which the objective is to have a unified socialist Africa under scientific socialism. And we've had plenty of episodes where we address these types of issues. So go back to our former episodes where we address scientific socialism, where we address uh, struggling over particular concepts, where we just really want to encourage organization in the beginning and the end. Every episode we encourage organization. That's what is, this is about. And this episode is actually going to be in regards to struggling in organizations and the struggle that some people may not feel their voices are valued because in capitalist society, you have hierarchical structures where people who have more experience, people who um, are higher up in whatever chain, if you will, are valued more in particular societies. In the organization, we hope to have and we aim to have, everyone's voice is valued. And that is what this episode is going to focus on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But of course, we are here to honor our ancestors because without the ancestors, we wouldn't be here doing this work. So we want to honor Audre Lord. We're gonna talk about Audre Lord for a little bit. Audre Lord actually, she taught at Hunter College. I know that's not even the biggest <laughs> credential. I'm just saying that because I actually did go to Hunter College. So I'm like, I graduated from the place that Audre Lord taught. Ah, no. <laughs> And if anyone has studied in any way, shape, or form uh, any sort of uh, revolutionary political theory, if anyone studied uh, anti-capitalist feminism, if anyone's uh, studied Africans in the feminist movement, in anti-patriarchal movements, I guarantee you have heard of Audre Lorde. People may have met Audre Lorde. I don't know. But one of the phrases that people tend to use when it comes to Audre Lorde is talking about the master's tools not being able to dismantle the master's house. And people sort of phrase it and rephrase it in different ways, but that is the basic concept. You cannot utilize the tools of colonialism to get rid of colonialism, basically. <laughs> you cannot utilize in full tools of capitalism to get rid of capitalism. So of course, there's a dialectical framework around that because you know we're using these computers or whatever. I mean, you could call that a tool of capitalism, I guess. And you know, technology, because of course capitalism is fueled by technology. So yeah, the, you can say, okay, we're using tools or you have jobs or whatever, but what Audre Lorde is referring to is that you cannot, uh, break down an oppressive system with that same uh, oppressive tool. So in short, so Audre Lorde is uh, an incredible human and also addressed the lack of uh, an intersectional analysis when it came to feminism. So that's a huge thing. There's a ton of writings, please go to a library, uh, please, you get some of her books, some of her writings. Uh, you can read some of those things online, but of course, uh, more of her writings are in books. <laughs> but Audre Lorde is a really incredible human being when addressing these issues around colonialism, around patriarchy, around capitalism. And she's, I remember when 
I was studying Audre Lorde and I had heard of Audre Lorde. I was like, okay, this is, you know, just because studying a lot of feminist theory, but really getting into Audre Lorde, I think that's when a lot of it really hit me. It was like, oh, okay, now a lot of this makes sense because, you know, people talk about Gloria Steinem, but Gloria Steinem didn't really, didn't really gel with me. And of course, there's that, you know, CIA connection and Henry Kissinger and everything with Gloria Steinem. That's a whole other conversation. But, you know, that, that type of thing didn't gel with me. But getting into folks like Audre Lorde, it began to make a lot of sense for me. So we're honoring Audre Lorde in this episode. Who else are we honoring, Evan? Uh, we're also honoring uh, Maurice Bishop, former uh, leader of of Grenada during the Grenadian Revolution, 1979-1983. And speaking of Hunter Collins, uh, if you've ever seen a speech of Maurice Bishop, uh, uh, there's a speech from uh, June, June 5th, 1983, uh, he was speaking at Hunter College. So again, so this, everything's connected, I tell you. <laughs> so oh, uh, one amazing thing about uh, Grenada during that time was like, a very small island and uh, they have a revolution against was, was a uh, neocolonial uh, uh, prime minister, Eric Gary. Uh, they uh, overthrew him and also implemented uh, like literacy programs, education, uh, healthcare, and so on. Uh, so was, uh, links with uh, uh, other revolutionary uh, views uh, such as uh, Cuba, Miguel Castro, and Nicaragua, the Sandinistas, and uh, Daniel Ortega. And as you see, they're still messing with Cuba, still messing with Nicaragua. So, and of course, you know, there was the a coup against against his uh, leadership in, uh, within the party in 1983. And soon after that, there was the U.S. the U.S. sneaks invasion of Grenada. And as you see, and one, one and one thing that always marveled me, like when I first heard, like Grenada it was like, like why, why would it, why would the U.S. like invade Grenada? Like what what it, it, like it always confused me. It, it, but when you read about what, the things that, that happened and how, like, like to like the extent of the Cold War, this color like Cold War, like, like, it's like almost like sociopathy, basically. That uh, that there's that there's so there's so there's such fear that that oh they're gonna give us the communists. The communists are gonna come. They're gonna come through Grenada. They're gonna do all this blah 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 and. And, if, and, if, and I mentioned the speech that he, uh, uh, Bishop gave. He's like that the that the that the thing that made the Great Revolution so dangerous is that he is a, a pretty much an African of uh, uh, African diaspora nation, and they speak English. And when you have that example, just like so close to uh, not not the United, United United States, but also other places along the other English speaking. Uh, nations in the, in the Caribbean. It, that's uh, that's something that, that's like that combination of like African liberation and liberation of capitalism, like those two together. That that's like that's all, that's been a long time uh, struggle that the United States has had. So, <laughs> and I think, and if you want to read more, want to read more about this, uh, there's a book called Maurice Bishop Speaks, which has a lot of. Uh, speeches and writings that she's done. So we always want to check it out and understand like what they did is, and yes. Absolutely. Uh, Maurice Bishop was definitely a captivating speaker. And looking at, you know, when they filmed his speeches and you look at the audience and you look at their faces before he, he spoke and after, people are like oh I finally understand the connection same thing just it made so much sense listening to his speeches and reading and uh, because you know when I was a kid people oh Granada 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 and then studying that it, it made so much sense and I talk about Granada in the sense of explaining my 10 minute explanation of U.S. policy does any any place that is formulating a socialist or communist government or political party, uh, the U.S. works to prevent. That is literally the 10 second explanation of U.S. international policy, imperialism, 
whatever you want to call it. But that's what happened with Afghanistan. That's uh, what happened with Grenada. That's what's happening in relation to Cuba. That is what happened with Vietnam. That is what happened with Chile. And that's what's happening all over the world. So this whole idea of bringing and installing democracy around the world, pay attention to what's happening in between. If you wanted to install democracy around the world, you wouldn't put military bases in there <laughs> to protect some sort of resource. So think about that. And from us to you, that is a little tip. If someone's like, well, why is the U.S. there? Just say, well, yeah, they're there to, uh, you know, protect their interests and to take over resources and pre prevent uh, communist and socialist political parties from popping up. <laughs> That's our gift. Hey. To you. <laughs> and 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 not, and not only that, if it was so much democracy, so it was about spreading democracy, why would they support the Pinochet? Why would they support Suharto? Why would they support all those military leaders in Guatemala? Why would they support the Shah of Iran? Like all, like th these are these are not. If you just say anything about democratic government, these are not democratic governments of any kind. So, exactly, absolutely, and that kind of leads into the conversation we want to have because when we go to these capitalist institutions called schools. They don't teach us any of that. And so, especially now, people are starting to learn about U.S. policy. And people are, well, I feel really stupid that I didn't know any of this. We all had a place where we didn't know any of this, especially if we were trained in these institutions. We all have to start somewhere. So it is not necessary to feel like we're not good enough. It's not necessary to feel like, well, I don't know as much as you. It's not necessary to feel like, well, I'm just going to drop out of this whole thing because I'm dumb. I don't know. I'm stupid. And uh, it's not necessary. I wanted to really, before I hear your take on it, I want to really address my own contradictions with this because when... I had the accident. I felt really anxious that I couldn't get involved because A, I had limited capacity mentally. I literally could not communicate that well. I couldn't, like you saw my text. I could hardly text. <laughs> I could hardly really get a sentence in that was effective. I could hardly remember anything. And I was on a ton of uh, narcotics and everything just to deal with the pain, which didn't necessarily help. But uh, I just felt so anxious that I couldn't do the work. And I was like, oh, no, you need to chill. It's okay. You do so much work already. You're you, like, what you've done is important. You'll get back into it. And I just felt like if I stop, I'm not gonna, I just don't feel good enough to do this work. I have to keep doing it. And I continue to have a lot of anxiety around that. I continue to have anxiety around me not being good enough, even though, yeah, I may participate in all of these things. I may do all of this work in this organization, but I am still feeling like I'm not good enough. So that's me <laughs> saying that. I can imagine how someone feels that may not, uh, they may not have retained the information. They may be new to this organization. They may, like a lot of the information we talk about may be going over their heads and people tend to stay quiet. And uh, people are just like, well, I don't have anything to say. I don't know what to say. And it actually really does make me sad because we are an organization, the AAPRP is an organization that encourages the masses to do this type of organizing, which means that we're going to have all types of experiences in this work. And with that, there is an understanding that everyone learns differently. There's an understanding that because people enter this organization at different dates on different levels, everyone's not going 
to have the same level of study if you've been doing this work for 40 years versus someone doing this work for two weeks. There's different levels of where someone's at in their analysis. There's different levels of where someone's at in their activity. That does not mean the person who has been in this organization who is cadre for 40 years, that doesn't mean they are intrinsically better than the person who's been there for two weeks. That makes no type of sense. How can we build a party if that's how we think of folks? And it just really does make me sad that because of the society that many of us have come from, particularly if we live in the snakes, because there's always that, ooh, 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 you know, I know all the answers or whatever. So there's always that person, everyone just sits back, okay, just let them, let them do all the talking. <laughs> and so we're just, like, people in capitalist society do not encourage us to speak if we do not know something. Capitalist society does not encourage us to ask questions if we do not know. We're just expected to go do things on our own. And then when we know something, okay, I know the answer. So it, it's this isolationist type of environment that, you know, I could be totally wrong, that, that discourages people from being okay with not knowing everything, being okay with making mistakes, being okay with um, having a self-criticism process, being okay with you know, just, just being okay with being okay. And it just really, uh, I just have a hard time with that. And again, a lot of this is coming from myself as I explained. And then I am on all these committees and task forces and I still feel like I'm not good enough. So again, imagine someone who's just here, it's like, oh, you're doing all this work. I just feel so inadequate. You're doing so much. I'm not there yet. You're better than me. And that, and I just want to tell everyone who's doing this work, uh, particularly in the AAPRP, but especially it, it, it just whatever organization, whatever revolutionary organization you're in, we're all here to do the work. No one is better than anyone else, regardless of where you started doing this work. Uh, definitely. And I definitely, I definitely feel what you, what you mean as far as having this sort of inaccuracy of, oh, I, I'm like, you're on, on this committee, you're doing this work day, this work day, and then all of a sudden, but then at some point you feel like, man, like, you see, like, you think some of our like some of the like some of our ancestors we talked about they they're they're getting locked up they're getting spied on they're getting like, shot at so so on so forth they think man they're doing all that they're doing all this they're, and then they will be part of the like, revolution but I'm here and we're just like a few people and like am I, am I really doing enough it's like, it's, it's like and and then I think uh you were you were talking to me uh before about how. Uh, like our comrade Jama, and by the way, you should definitely check out the episode. But uh, again, like Conrad John was talking about, like you can't you can't really fail a revolution. Like you you can't really like like if you say the wrong thing or quote quote the wrong thing like, again like again that point of like wrong like what is wrong like again the sort of like this value judgment of uh, if I make make a mistake on some name or make up some concept or talk about something. That might be composed to something. So some of the values, ideologies that you say, oh, I, oh, I can't get this. I can't do this. I, I'm done. <laughs> but um, but again, I, th I think you just have to think that like your con your contribution is worth it. Like if you if you're there for a few there for a few months, like it's it's worth it. That that whatever you do, as long as you're taking the time to like understand to talk with people, say hey. I, I've read this about. I think oh, we, we talked about this early, early uh, uh, during our work study. Like, uh, we mentioned uh, Papa Doc. We talked about Papa Doc and and the role of of the Duvaliers in Haiti. And uh, well, well, what will be Papa Doc so 
like, oh, what, why is this, why is pop up brought up in such a way? And it was like, okay, well, we talked about like the issue of like the United States and Haiti and the role of, and how even though he spoke, he spoke about, oh, we're doing this for like trying to like re- re- uh, uplift Africans and so on. But like they doing, he's doing stuff like he's doing work, he's work, he's doing stuff that's working for the land, like the large landowners. He's doing stuff like making movies, like exploited movies for of the Africans and yeah. So again, like like it's a, like like like, it's like for some people like they don't understand, but they're like okay, we'll we'll take time to like talk about it and yeah, and there, and there's some things where they like, like you know, Jamil and I like we're, we're like the two longest in our work day, but there are even some points where like we're like we're talking about something, but we're like. You know, I'm not sure, but I, but again, it's always, it's always helpful to say, like, yeah, it's always great to, like, share your knowledge from all the experience you have, all the stuff you learn from your fellow comrades and all that. That's also okay to say, like, you know what, I need to do some more, or I think it's this, but don't quote me, or, like, it's, again, it's like having that, like, as we talked about with the criticism, self-criticism, another episode, where, it's like it's okay to say right, that you're not sure. It's like it, like if you want to create an environment where you know, sort of for revolutionary uh, humanism that we're we're all on equal footing, that we're all working as a collective, that we're all treating people as ends in themselves and not just a means. You have to have this. You have to have this ability to say, "I'm not sure," or "Hey, I see you, you're struggling. I'll help you." Or and you're doing it because you think you, that their, their their growth is important for everyone, and not just oh I'm going to get ahead because I'm helping you again. So, and I think another thing that we were talking about beforehand is uh, I was at this a I was at this uh, I think it was like a seminar or something from this organization called the uh, Movement for Justice in El Barrio, uh, it was a great organization. You should check out, if, if, especially if you're up here in the East Harlem or what's called Occupied and Operated Land. And like they do basically what's called like basically an urban Zapatista work. So they're working against uh, developers and landlords, organizing buildings, so forth. And one of the keys that they borrow from the Zapatistas, the, the EZRN, is that, is that it spends like they use about 70% listening, 30% talking. So when you're spending a, more of that time listening, uh, and that, uh, as Jamila said, like it's okay, if, it's okay if like you're new, you're to an organization, you you, you do want to listen. You don't want to, you want to make sure that hey, I understand like how the dynamics are. You do want, you want to do that, but at the same time, like if, once you get that listening, once you understand what's going on, it's okay to say, yeah, I hear I hear what you're saying, but could you repeat that? Or I think when you were saying this. It meant da 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 da. Like, it's okay to do that, and and then obviously like everyone had works at different speeds. Some people might come in, they understand what's going on, and they talk. Some people might take a lot longer, and again, it's okay. But just accept that it's okay. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things in practicing humanism is acceptance. And there is an episode that uh, the, uh, the New Mexico chapter did. It was a competition versus cooperation. And I think that is one thing, again, in this capitalist society, in this individualist society, you talk about listening. Listening is that aspect of cooperation. And when we listen, we value what someone else has to say And when we listen, we end up reflecting back. And as you're saying, asking that question, oh, what exactly did you mean? And we don't particularly do enough of that because in many of our conversations, we anticipate responding to something. So everything's a reaction. And so it's like, oh, oh, I'm really excited about this thing. So, you know, sometimes it's fun to just, you know, everybody cuts each other off, whatever, but, but that's not always good to do. We have to acknowledge that's not always good to do, especially when 
it is something like a work study session or if we're having uh, a committee meeting or something like that, really listen to what we have to say, particularly folks who aren't dudes. So what tends to happen at meetings is dudes will take over <laughs> and um, women, non-men, non-binary folks, et cetera, marginalized gender folks um, tend to fall back. And I think, again, that's how we're conditioned that men speak first, men speak the most, men take up the most space, and it becomes this thing. We don't even realize it's happening until someone brings it up. And it's like, well, I don't know. He had enough knowledge. And so it becomes this thing, and, and all the people who aren't dudes either don't say anything, say things that are minimal, or just, okay, can you speak now? And I am a person... When I first joined the AAPRP, it was the same exact thing. I was very good, much quieter than I am now. And people like, I cannot hear you. Can you speak up? <laughs> I said, what? I do? Okay, I don't. And then it still gets to this thing, even to this day, where if I'm not fast enough, people, I'm like, I want to say something. I'm getting ready to say something and people will jump in. It still happens to me to this day, even though, I project my voice a, a lot more now, but I also am a person that does take up a lot more space than I used to because of those things, because people used to talk over me all the time. People couldn't hear me. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to take up space because it's not that I'm trying to be mean, it's that my voice is valued too. And um, if everyone is really valued in this organization or wherever you are in a revolutionary organization, whatever it is, everyone's voice should be valued. And if the same people are speaking all the time, which does happen because some people do not speak up. And you know, again, I don't know that much, I'm new. And if you're very new, I absolutely agree with you, Evan. It's good to just take it all in and say, okay, this is, this is how it goes. But if you're still doing that after five meetings, like, I want to know what you think. And this happens way too often for people who are not dudes. And it makes me really, really sad that, you know, if, if we are really working on challenging the contradictions of patriarchy that exist in our societies and, and within, then we also have to understand these patterns go on that people who are not dudes kind of either shut down or may feel like they're not knowledgeable enough or good enough to have their voice valued. And so maybe it's not a point of, well, I don't feel like my voice is valued, but I do think in a lot of ways, it's like, well, I don't know that much. I'm not that new, this, that, or the other. And we have to encourage people. I think maybe it's something that we have to put into practice at every meeting. Everyone's voice is valued. Please, if you have anything to say, please, it's okay. We value you. And, you know, because there's people who, you know, this is at every meeting. There are people who have to point a process and all the whatever. I, don't know. I mean, we don't really do Robert's rules or anything, but you know what I mean? It's like, okay, like we're getting off the point here. And, you know, and then that one person will come out who didn't speak for the whole meeting and say the most succinct point of the whole meeting. It's like, oh, thank you. So that is what we need more of because that person who has not spoken has fresh eyes as opposed to people who, again, have been in this organization for 40 years. And it was just kind of like, but this, that, and the other. And then this one person says, well, what about that? Like, yes. <laughs> and so I think with what we're working towards in terms of dealing with the contradictions around patriarchy, we're seeing a lot of this as well. There are folks who are just getting in more recently to the AAPRP, bringing in some ideas that you know are fighting these contradictions 
because they're, they've been doing work outside of the AAPRP as well and bringing that to the table. And then just building an analysis, how to build an analysis in regards to Pan-Africanism and um, fighting patriarchy. Like all of these things are connected. So it's always important that there are folks who are newer to the struggle, maybe not in other organizations, but in the AAPRP. And it's like, oh, well, you know, here are some things we did in regards to a 10 point plan and fighting uh, you know, gender oppression. Oh, here, this is what we did. You know, we always need to have that element. We need to have those eyes. And from the elders to the youth, we need all of those perspectives. But if we're taking a lot from what we're conditioned with outside, it's not gonna happen. So we have to really, really struggle with that and we shall not fear the struggle. I think it's really important. I love that you said that. It's, we cannot fear the struggle because once we fear that struggle, as uh, Frederick Douglass said, no struggle, no progress. So uh, we're not going to move on in the struggle for a better world for any of us if we're just stuck in these ways and we don't encourage uh, fresh eyes to really challenge a lot of you know what we've been conditioned with because uh, for me even you know being in the bubble when I was organizing in Oregon Oregon chapter and the people that I spent time with the people I lived with it, it was just this bubble and I could talk to folks about the work that we're doing. I could talk to folks that you wouldn't get any argument. It'd be like, that's really cool. You're doing all this work in the AAPRP. Da, da. And then I moved back to the East Coast. Whoa. It was like, wow. So like, I have not seen this amount of patriarchy in years. So I struggled so much with that. The amount of homophobia at my jobs, the Oh, I worked at this one place where I was the only woman in a department and it was, I got stressed. I cried. I, I never like to take the job with me when I'm outside. I don't even like to take the job with me when I'm at the job, but yeah, I, it, that's really the first time, uh, one of the rare times I had to process what happened to me at my job because it was so toxic. And we don't want to take that in our organizing spaces. We want to challenge all of those things. And if we're not advocating for marginalized folks who are in this organization to be able to have a voice, whether it's because they're younger or whether it's because they're newer in the organization or gender or whatever reason, and I'm just sort of speaking in generalities um, because I'm, I'm not pointing to particular people or anything. But I'm saying in any revolutionary organization, we have to be able to advocate for spaces for voices who don't, who don't have the ability to, to speak outside of these spaces. And it's really difficult for me to see, once again, <laughs> somebody is just, is just not talking at all. It really, it does get to me emotionally, I have to say. That was me at one point. And somehow, I don't know along the lines of where it happened, but I was just like, okay, I, j I just, I don't even care anymore. And y'all gonna listen to me. <laughs> and I just want to advocate and encourage for people who were in that position I was to not be afraid to take up that space, especially if you are a marginalized gender person, especially if you don't have that space outside of, of these organizing spaces, just take up that space. And if there is an accountability that needs to be had, let's do that. But don't come into there being like, well, you know, like 
Well, y'all just gonna think what I have to say is bad because like we don't know that like you might have the most succinct thing to say out of this whole experience, out of this whole meeting. And we don't know that if you don't use your voice. And you know, obviously, you know, I mean, this could be seen as uh, a an ableist conversation in a way. And like I'm not even necessarily talking about talking, because we can use our voice in various ways. Um, and, you know, we can use it through writing, we can use it through, through various means. So it's, you know, I'm a person who does write, and I am a better writer than I am talker. But I um, really think whatever means we have to communicate, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, we still need to be able to advocate for those voices to be heard. And it's just again, talking about larger societies and, you know, whatever organizations we have, there's still contradictions inside of it. And we need to address those contradictions. And I think for me, the AAPRP is one of those organizations. I think it is, it is encouraged to address those contradictions. So I absolutely love the AAPRP. I've been organizing with the AAPRP for almost nine years, I think. So um, I think next year it'll be nine years. So obviously, <laughs> obviously there is something that um, I think the values that I have in my own life, um, they align with the AAPRP in a way that I'm able to struggle principally uh, within the party and outside of it. And just giving that type of, of structure, that type of organization, that uh, type of value, I think is really important. And I think everyone should be able to experience that. For sure. And I, I, def I definitely have, I felt that's the same feeling of like coming in and not, not being sure, but then over time, like, okay, it, and I think the other thing, as we talked about that, that, the great thing was like, being encouraged to, like, I don't want to say make mistakes, but being encouraged to just, like, get what's off your chest to say, yeah, and then, and then if there is, like, need for struggle, that is done, like, in a principal way, and, and I, I always also speak on from, not, 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 not to say that I, they take up a ton of space for anything, but or like for people who, like in just like in any or like whether it's in the AFRP or any revolutionary organization, that if you are someone who like they, you does like tend to have like tend to get, like get that those last words, especially if you're like some if you're especially if you're male or, or college educated or or so on that that it's okay like it's so that if someone like has disagreement or or wants to say something, you know, like ask clarity. It's again, it's okay to say, "All right, I'll let you go." <laughs> so, and, and again, it's not to do it out of charity. It's to do it because, like, if, especially like with us, we're we try to build a mass organization, and you can't have really have a mass organization if you just have a few people who who saying or doing the same things again and again. Like, you have to have, create that environment where people who like may not. Like come out of the same political circles and like uh, come in and say like say so say I have something valuable to say even if you even if you never heard, even if you never heard of Brian Kruger, if you even if you never read like the stuff like, like you have you have some your your contribution is worth it I'm just just saying and people, and we're and we're here to like bring it along and say that maybe there's something like again like uh, especially see this in a lot like or, like left wing spaces as well or circles or whoops there but um and you get and you get this idea of uh, if you're not if you haven't done breath if you haven't done the reading or you haven't said the right things or you haven't said things and uh was not worth like what what are you doing in here but again it that that's not that's that's not trying to do a revolution that's that's a that's a club <laughs> and so yeah in terms of the reading because a lot of the readings we have, you know, um, especially a book like How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, it's that is a book 
it is one of my favorite books in the whole world. It answers so many questions around why is Africa so poor? Africa is not poor. And here's the, here's your answer. <laughs> Read this book. But it is a book that needs to be read several times to really understand it. And that's the thing. We're, we're, it's the thing is about reading is we have these institutions. We're made to read these particular types of books. I don't want to read anything that seems heady or outside of school. I already have to read these. So the work study process, I think, really does encourage, you know, okay, you have a lot of these questions. These books are going to have concepts that will explain them to you succinctly. But we also have a process in that study to go over it together. What happens when you go to these capitalist schooling institutions is you have to read a book by yourself and then you go talk about it. And then you have 45 minutes or whatever, maybe an hour to discuss it with 40, 50, maybe 100 people in that class. So there's really no space to to dissect it. There's no space to digest it. There's no space because it's like, well, we're just going over these things or whatever. And okay, next chapter ring, it goes over. And so that is how in particular societies people learn. And in a work study process, it's like we're going to really go over these concepts. If it takes three hours, we're going to go over what colonialism is. If people really do not understand what that is, we're gonna go over it until everyone understands it. If we have to do this chapter over in our next session, we will do that, but we wanna make sure everyone has the basic concepts. Please, if you don't understand that, please say so, so we all have the understanding because the point of work study is to fine tune an analysis. So when you go out in the world, I have to deal with these contradictions, you can do that with confidence. That's what it's about building, not only an analysis, but building confidence to have an understanding and analysis to go on in the world. So yeah, we will address capitalism. What is capitalism? If you don't understand it, by the time the session's over, we're gonna address it again in our next session. Because that is what we do, because Everyone is valued. It's like, okay, we're going to go through this thing. And somebody's like, I don't understand. It's like, okay, we'll go, we'll go over it. This is just because you don't understand it. You are not a bad person. There was a point where none of us understood that because that's not what we got. It was just capitalism's good. Yay, USA. Yay, revolution. That's the, that's the education that we got. So Many of us are learning these concepts which are new. And because we haven't learned um, the roots of imperialism, we haven't learned um, the, the vestiges of capitalism in these types of educational systems. Of course, in Cuba, they understand what that is. <laughs> of course, in places that deal with US imperialism, they know very well what it is. But places that encourage it, we don't learn about these things. I mean, they're learning in textbooks now that um, Africans who were enslaved were just workers. That, you know, it's like undocumented work. I mean, that's what they're telling you now. So imagine this is what little kids are learning now. It, this is what they have to deal with. So now, you know, they're getting how Europe underdeveloped Africa. They're like, well, didn't Africans uh, sell each other? And I, so it's like, here, here's the answer to your book. Here's um, uh, W.B. Du Bois. <laughs> it's just the world in Africa. Here's Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery. And you'll find your answers there. Have a good day. But join our work study session and we will go through them with you in depth if that is what you need. And that is the process that is encouraged, but is not encouraged in the world that is teaching you, yay capitalism, yay, imperialism, yay, colonialism, yay, neo-colonialism, yay, patriarchy, yay, Zionism. And so this is what we are talking about, encouraging people to ask those questions, encouraging people to say, I'm struggling with this and to not fear that struggle. Because if we go on the world, because what's going to happen, we get really excited about this work. 
we're like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the AARP. And somebody's like, what's the AARPRP? And we're like, uh, you know, it's, it's like, Ugh. and I'm sure that's happened to a lot of us. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah. So we will go over it with you. We will go over with you. And then, uh, you know, I get a lot of conversations around people defending capitalism. Like, well, I'm a capitalist. Like, oh, are you? You have capital? Really? So, you know, it's just that kind of that kind of thing where once you have the analysis and you've studied a lot of these concepts, you're able to just be like, oh, you have capital? Okay, what does capitalism mean? You know, and you know the answer, but guarantee you a lot of these people don't. So some of the some of them do and still defend it. That's you know, but a lot of people who say they're capitalists don't even know what it is. Um, a lot of people want to hate on socialism, have no idea what it is. Communism has killed 50, 11 billion people. They don't even know what communism is. How can, how can you have a state and communism at the same time? Can somebody tell me? Anybody who says communism is bad and that uh, it's rationing by the state, how, t- tell me how you can have the state and communism at the same time. I just want to know because I, I never heard of it. So I don't know. But that's the thing. I want you to have this process, you are able to understand the concepts because again, we have a process where we're going over. And sometimes, you know, those concepts are going to repeat itself because we read all these Nkrumah books. <laughs> we read all of these other. So, uh, so also because uh, I'm sure a lot of people coming in, they like many other people who aren't doing revolutionary organizing only attribute socialism to Marx, for instance, or it's just a European philosophy or communism is just a European philosophy. But once again, you read Nkrumah, if you read Maurice Bishop, if you listen to Maurice Bishop's speeches, if you read any sort of thing regarding the global South and revolutionary movements, you will have a better understanding of what socialism is globally. And it's not just concentrated on this one continent. <laughs> I'm like, well, excuse me? Again, let's go back to the beginning. What is US international policy, people? <laughs> Obviously, exactly. <laughs> communism, I mean, communism has not been in its full existence because we haven't had socialism globally. So obviously, you know, but you know, having communist parties and having socialist parties. Do you think Europe's the only continent that has had socialist parties? Like, we have to think about that. <laughs> we have to really think about that. So to think, you know, like everything else, Eurocent- Eurocentrism drives a lot of our thoughts, whether or not it's conscious. And so we're talking about, you know, communism, socialism, we're even uh, addressing how capitalism is good for the world, but you look at policies, you look at AFRICOM, you look at what's happening in Haiti. How can you say capitalism is good for the world? So examining books like The World in Africa, examining books like uh, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, I, that will give you a better answer, but we have to be able to go through it together to understand those concepts. And it took me a, a few times to really, you know, I've read how Europe underdeveloped Africa a number of times. And every single time I read it, I'm just like, oh, yes, 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 yes. So just because you've read something, it doesn't mean that you even get all the concepts the first time. And so that's what the work study process is about. We still have to gather this information and, and we, we explore it together, no matter how long we've been doing this work, there are things that we do not retain and there are mistakes that we make. So every single person's voice is valued. There is no way that should not happen that someone comes out of this saying, you know what, I don't feel hurt. I don't feel valued. I feel like my voice is being diminished in this work. Anybody comes to you and says that, come to me. (laughs) <laughs> and be like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Or me. Right. Either one. Yeah, it, that's it right. <laughs> Come to me or Evan and be like, we're going we're gonna to address this. Because I, re- I feel very passionate about this. Not only because um, 
it's not that I even necessarily experienced feeling devalued. It's just, I know that my voice, I didn't project my voice. I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like, oh, you know, so it's not that I was even devalued, especially, you know, organizing with somebody like Ajamu who was just like, you, you know, you're important. <laughs> so, so I didn't necessarily feel devalued, but I know that, you know, my voice didn't project and I didn't feel, again, I didn't feel good. I still, to this day, I'm just like, I don't feel good enough. I don't care how many people are like, no, you're, I still, I'm just like, yeah, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I still, I still shrink up. And, you know, so again, I'm not saying this because of whatever reason. I'm saying this because I'm still feeling that. So I feel the pain of people who, you know, may feel diminished. I'm not even saying I feel diminished. I'm just saying I don't feel that, you know, I'm good enough because I'm like, there's people doing so much more. So the fact that I'm saying that I can imagine what someone else is feeling. So I'm just here as a person with empathy, as a person who is doing this work to, to, to not fear the struggle, to know that your voice is important. And I know that, you know, even as I'm saying, you know, I feel like man, I'm not good enough. I'm not like, am I doing enough? And, you know, I look at, I look at uh, Kwame Ture and I look at Moina Kriyate and I look at all of these people who are here. I look at Comrade Mzuri. I look at all these people I love dearly in this organization. I, I sit back and I go, <laughs> so I'm saying this to you, you listening and watching who may feel that you're not valued because you're newer in this organization. I've been here for almost nine years and people, your work is so important. I'm like, thanks. Okay. So just know that your work is so important. The fact that you made the decision to join this organization, that is important. The, the day one, that is important. Any step you take to join a revolutionary organization, any step you take to say, you know, I want to fight these forces of oppression, that is a huge step because not everyone is doing it. So just know that that step you take, that crawl into a walk is just as important as anyone who's been doing this for 40, 50, 60 years, any of our ancestors, the fact that you took that step to join an organization, the fact that you said, I wanna do something about it. I just don't wanna sit and be passive. I wanna be active in this organizing, in this struggle. You are making the ancestors proud. Just know you are making the ancestors proud. And the, when you begin to use your voice, whether that's your vocal cords, whether it's writing, whether it's sign language, whether it's dance, whatever it is for you, how you communicate, just know that you are continuing the struggle that our ancestors did. And I'm passionate about this because I'm not just saying this to you, I'm saying this to myself too. And again, every single day of my life, I still feel, I'm getting ready to cry, but every single day of my life, I feel like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm just, I like, I look at, like, I look at my, my, my family, my dear comrade Onya Samu, and I was like, wow, you know, I feel inspired by Onya Samu, by, by all of that work. I feel inspired by Jamu. I feel inspired in, in Zuri, Nahanda, like so many of our comrades who are doing this work. I get, I, like, look at Comrade Akabundu. I look at all these people who are doing this work, Comrade Amani, the comrades in Guinea-Bissau, like I'm just sitting back and I'm like, wow, like I wanna be on that level. I still feel like a baby in this organization and I see on your Samu, and I'm like, wow. You know, so I'm just like, that's where I wanna be. I still feel like, everybody's like, no, but, but I still feel like I'm not there. And I just, you know, I have to fight that within myself. So just if you are new in this organization and you feel like wow you know like you're doing all this stuff i don't know just know you are so valued you are just any the step that you are taking 
towards understanding the role that you have in the struggle towards African liberation, the role in the struggle against capitalism, the role that you have in the struggle, just know every step you are taking, it is a step you take daily. If you have to just take your baby steps, you'll get there. Look at me, I lost the leg, okay? I lost the leg, so I have to start over in many ways and sitting in the hospital and not being able to do that work because I was not able to, like, I didn't have that full capacity. And I, I said, you know what? I don't care if I don't have the technological capacity to do it. I don't care. Like, I'm going to attend work study even if I don't have the book on me because I don't have the ability to have the book right now. I'm going to um, attend um, like admin committee meetings. I'm going to attend um, task force meetings. I'm going to do this. Like, I don't care if I don't have a, a lot of capacity te technologically right now. I'm here lying in bed, but I'm just going to do it because it was so important to me. And even lying in the hospital bed, I was like, I still don't feel good enough because I don't have that capacity. And why am I getting ready to cry? But um, so just know. It's okay. It's a I know, I know. <laughs> But I um, <laughs> um, just know that that every piece of work that we're all doing here, no matter how big or how small, it all links to a particular purpose, to a particular objective, and we're all important. And I was telling Evan earlier, like Evan's knowledge of dates. Evan's knowledge of just the, the vast knowledge he has about history. I'm just like, I don't, I don't even have as vast of a knowledge. I have an understanding of concepts. <laughs> I have an understanding, like I understand, you know, events that happened and I know some people, but that's the value that Evan, I mean, obviously that's not the only value you bring Evan, but that is a value that you have and you bring so much to the table uh, when we're doing work study and when we're having these episodes and when we're at other meetings and we're doing all this organizing, like there is a value. Which is, and even sometimes I say like, wow, okay. Like, wow. <laughs> like, like, so, and sometimes I'm like, okay. Well, like even with you, I'm just admitting that, um, you know, and people are like, well, no, you're doing it. And I just like, well, like, I just don't feel good enough because I don't have all the dates and I don't have, you know, I, I don't, I can't retain all that information like Evan. So, you know, I still have that, that wheel going on in my head that's spinning that I don't feel good enough because I don't have the dates or I don't have this or that, but I have to understand and accept that, you know, where I'm at, you know, I'm still doing the work and the work that I do is just as important as the work that you do. And we both, uh, bring things to the table that we're good at. And I think acceptance is, is a really huge key. And I have to, you know, there's a lot of things I've accepted in my life. And this is one of the things that I really struggle over because I'm like the work, the work, it's so important. And, you know, and, and even the, the idea of rest, because I was like, well, you know, rest is revolutionary because if you don't rest, you know, you're going to wear yourself out and then you can't do the work. And I absolutely agree with that. I even tell other people that, but do I listen to that for myself? Not necessarily. So I'm like, well, okay, I have to do this, that, and the other. And, and, you know, but you have to rest. You have to replenish. You have to do all of these things. And I was talking to a comrade and saying, well, it would be amazing to know what our ancestors did you know, when they weren't organized. I mean, you're organizing like every moment of your life in one way or another, even if you're not having meetings or whatever. But like, what did they do for fun? Like, did they go and watch films? Did they listen to music? And that, that is an interesting question. Like, what exactly did they do? Because um, there is a time you need to say, okay, I need to rest and I need to, um, you know, have this other side of myself. Did did that happen? I don't know, but I feel like you know there are things I like to do, obviously. <laughs> but but 
I still feel like, oh no, you know, I, I just, I don't know. It's just the wheels turn in my head that it's just, I'm not good enough. And that's, that is something that I struggle with and I cannot fear that struggle, obviously, but yeah, it is some, something I do feel um, to this day and um, not just with my ancestors, but with the comrades I organize with now. And I, again, I, I'm probably going to re reiterate this a lot more is um, we're all valued. The, the fact that we're here doing this work and understand that this work is important um, should not be ignored. Um, the value that I bring, right. you know, it, it may be a different value than what you bring, but they're both just as important. I need to remember that. I really need to remember that, Evan. So this yeah, is okay. me making a total conclusion <laughs> on the air. This is like the therapy session of AAP right now. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's really important that we understand whether we have been in this organization for 50 years, 60 years, or two hours. We made that decision to understand that Africa is primary to us. Whatever organization it may be, your know, organization for uh, Philippine liberation, it may be Palestinian liberation, it may be Irish liberation, it whatever movement liberation, revolutionary struggle you are having, whether it's getting all indigenous land back, whatever that is for you, know that work is valued and important. And no work is more important than, than anyone else. If you're not doing the work, then that's another story. But we're all here struggling together. And I think you know, I need to acknowledge that. I don't, I, I, I'm sure you acknowledge that, but it's something again that I struggle with. And um, I need to acknowledge that. Like I have to stop fighting, you know, like, well, I'm not good enough. Cause I, cause I do feel that I'm, I'm just saying. I, 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 I totally understand. I, I, I know like there've been points where like, I think you, you, you said it to me, comrade John was said to me, all the people said to me, like, I, I haven't been even an organization, like I haven't even done like organizing, like generally as long as you've been in the ARP PSL and, and I like people are like, oh, you do so much work. Well, like, well, like, the people like know like if I'm on just like that tall uh, toy African like that cult that walks by from the work but uh, but um yeah like some like there are times like when like say we're doing facilitation and like, I don't I, I get a little I do the uh, 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 like sometimes so um yeah that's something I work on but uh, uh I'm like pretty like pretty self critical like if anyone knows like I, I think I've said this a few times like I'm very super self critical so but again like again if it's, and again like like we were discussing about like having your own pace as far as how much you want to like take up space and take up like space and so forth that is also okay to hey like, even when you doing even when you're doing that self criticism that's okay to like. Uh, yeah, it's okay to take data criticism because you you want to like help your people, help like liberate people and so forth. But at the same time, it's okay to it's okay to say, you know what, I do I do some damn good work. <laughs> like I I talked to people, I I gave people like a website for the for such and such party or such and such union or such. I've I've been able to go to this as this this march, this rally, and so forth, and talk to people about. Is I've been able to help people get fed or sleep, or I mean, able to help people get free from from these prisons. So, like every little thing, it's okay to it's okay to take little victories and like use that as motivation as much as the times when you need to like understand. Okay, where where where, is, where did I mess up? And and again, like like we said that the, it don't to not try and make uh, obviously if like you do some kind of like. Uh, interpersonal harm that's like different story <laughs> but um uh, just like as far as uh like how the discussion goes or how some like something ta some tactical instrument goes that again yeah you, you have to like take the time and always be able to ask 
always being able to ask, always being able to listen. And I think those are like the main points that I think we, we want to emphasize, ask and listen, ask and listen. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, but part of that too, yeah, the asking and listening, even those simple acts are part of uh, self-criticism because, and what, what are we conditioned to do? Always react. So we're always anticipating to talk before someone even finishes. So listening is, one of the most compassionate things we can do actually in many, many ways, especially for those who don't feel heard. And, you know, talking about, you know, especially if we're talking about uh, issues in relation to patriarchy and, you know, someone who is protected by patriarchy, for instance, goes, well, but this thing, right? It's like, Please listen. <laughs> Please listen. I I I understand that you have to say, but we're not like we're talking about this whole other thing over here. You know, can you reflect upon what you've heard in this conversation and not just react or anticipate to react? And so I think it, it is really one of the most compassionate things we can do in uh, revolutionary spaces is just to listen to each other and reflect back to each other what we've heard. And I think that is one of the things that does happen in a work study process. It may not be the traditional. So what I'm hearing you say is it may not be that, but it is a process of making sure that we understand the concepts. And again, if not everyone understands the concepts, we go over them until everyone has a basic understanding and we will go over them and over them and over them. And so I really do feel like uh, this struggle waged against these forces of individualism, capitalism, you have to have a type of compassion and empathy to recognize that if we are building a mass party, there's gonna be all kinds of people joining this organization. So you have to have some type of compassion and patience <laughs> because there are going to be people coming in. And so when you have the structures of how to, you know, deal with folks who may be abusive, um, you know, understanding that we all come from this space, or particularly, you know, if we're talking about the West, um, you know, and even places around the world that have been colonized, where there is gender-based violence, where, um, you know, there's um, uh, just all kind of physical and emotional and sexual violence. Uh, so, you know, coming to these spaces where these things happen, and if we are saying, you know, Africans are here, we're like open to Africans joining this organization, or whatever, but understanding that there are people coming from these structures of violence, that we have to be able to have patience and have a, have a structure which is able to deal with that. And so if you wanna call it transformative justice, if you want to call it an accountability process, but that accountability process has to be one uh, based on something humane. It can't be like, well, in order to join this organization, um, oh, you have to act a certain way or else get out. And then, no, that's not going to work because, again, that person is not going to feel heard. And they're going to be like, well, that organization doesn't like me because I'm a dude or whatever, you know. I don't know. But um, so we have to come into it with an analysis, but be prepared. This is why we do the anti-patriarchy work. Be prepared to have a response to those kind of things, but also have an understanding that the world that we are all conditioned with, we have to unlearn. We have to decolonize ourselves. So we have to understand that this person also has to go through a process of decolonization, also have to go through a process of accountability. So um, I, I think that is another thing that work study is good for, to you know, understand these concepts, understand the analysis, understand 
the root of why things are going on. And, um, and with that, having that process of accountability, you will begin to see more people who on the outside were not heard, more people like, oh, I decided to join this organization because I heard that you had um, an anti-patriarchy group. Oh, you know, you have an anti-patriarchy task force? Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just, I was in all these other organizations. They didn't have a process like that. I heard you did. So that is what we need to do. We need to continue to build this analysis and we need to continue to do this work to challenge these contradictions. So people have an understanding, this is where we stand on things. So if you join this organization, this is where we stand on things. We definitely value your voice, but these are particular values that we have. And we intend to stand by those values, stand beside those values, and stand in front of those values, not behind, in front of those values. So you want to join our organization, you are definitely welcome to. If this organization doesn't work out for you, there are plenty you can join, but please join one. <laughs> and every single person is valued. I just, I cannot say that enough. I really can't. Yes. Well, yes, we're about this, this valley in youth. And, and it's okay. Like, it, it's okay. Like, even if you, even if you listen to this, even if you say, okay, I, I get this. Uh, I, oh, I feel value. And then you go on the meeting and you're like, and then you still, you still have those feelings of, oh, uh, uh, again, it's okay. Like, it's okay. Again, it's okay. If you need time, you still need time. And if you need so ask someone, they should be they should be willing to like have that patience and stuff. And if they don't have that patience, well, that's something they have to work on too. So again, so it's a it's a multi pronged it's a multi pronged process. So that's what we get. That's what you understand. Absolutely. And this, I guess, this is more of a a message of love and understanding and a bit of self criticism, I guess. On my half, I don't know what yours, <laughs> a bit of self-reflection to just, again, your, your voice is heard, find a place where your voice is valued, wherever that is, but please ask questions. Please, if you are going to do this type of work, you have to be able to understand that your voice has to be valued. You have to understand to go out and do this work. You have to understand the concept. So ask questions. Have they're like, well, you know, uh, we're going through this too fast. So please, please, can we slow down? Just anything, just please, like anyone who is in this organization and doing this work, please, if you are watching this, if you are listening to this, please understand coming from myself and Evan, coming from the Kaji circle, and I'm sure from plenty of other circles in the AAPRP, but myself and Evan, right now in this moment as we are speaking, you are valued. Please do not fear the struggle because we are always trained in capitalist society to fight struggle because we want to avoid struggle because struggle is bad and it is not bad here. It is not a bad thing at all here. Struggle is a very positive thing in this organization because that is how we grow. So on that note, I don't know if you have any other words uh, to round out this episode. What I want to say is join an organization. <laughs> yes, join join our organization, please. And and, and even when you talk about the, the struggles that, yeah, like even in, within this like uh, capitalist uh, patriarchal like, the colonized world that uh, like there is like struggle like struggle does get like um lionized to some extent and, but in a way that is like hyper individualistic hyper like uh paternalistic uh, that way but the struggle we're talking about is like, a collective struggle against forces that want to like, like these anti-people's forces like we talk about the people's classes the anti-people classes like the struggle is for the people's classes not but it because they because like they'll they'll, talk, they'll they'll like you see you watch like a, a, if I, I don't know if I mentioned other podcasts but I 
I, I watch a lot of like professional sports and so and a lot of, a lot of narrative goes like oh this person struggled oh they they struggled against this like and you especially see this in like the the capital olympics <laughs> um like the those like uh what you call those like the sob stories or uh like puff pieces or whatever they, they get, they'll have those and and you're like wow so so came from such such a poor nation or Da, 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 and they and they able to do all this and but like yeah why but he's like well why is this nation poor why is this nation war torn why 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 did they come from an area where they had to struggle like that whereas someone can have like family upon family who doing this for generations again again but this, this is, again this is a point that struggle gets lionized in certain ways but if you struggle in ways for the liberation of people and there's a difference. This is a story, but again, join an organization that's doing that struggle for the people's classes. Absolutely. And while you're at it, we also have our comrades doing some presentations, some webinars, some programs, some podcasts, different things you can call it, but they're all here for the mission that we are here for. And that is the process of liberation that we are all involved in. And these, of course, podcasts, et cetera, are presented by the AAPRP. So we are the Pencil Podcast, of course, but we have our ancestors' voices. And that is uh, Jammu and Shakura, comrades of Jammu and Shakura. And you mentioned earlier that Jammu was on a past episode. So go look for that. <laughs> yes, we have, we have a whole playlist right there. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so they have um, a presentations that they do every Sunday. And then we have our comrades in the New Mexico or Tiwa Territory chapter. So they have their podcasts on Thursdays. We have Revolutionary African Women. And so they are once a month. And we have um, For Whatever podcast. And they are on Spotify. And so they do episodes once in a while as well. And of course, there is the a PRP YouTube channel, it's the international channel. You can see all kinds of things, all kinds of webinars, all kinds of presentations that exist throughout the year. And of course, forever because it's on the internet. <laughs> so there are lots of things you can do every day if you want to see something in relation to AAPRP. And of course, there are so many of our comrades in uh, Black Power Media, and there's a ton of AAPRP connection there <laughs> and, and uh, Black Alliance for Peace connections. So there's so many ways that you can um, follow up on this struggle, but there are plenty of organizations to join. The AAPRP is just one of those many organizations. So we really do want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for listening and or watching. And we want to say forward ever, backwards never. <laughs> or. <laughs>